there have been so many moments in my life when I've thought that I've had a sense of what was going on and writing made me realize that I didn't know what I was talking about. And it also allowed me to structure my ideas. And there's a certain kind of thinking that you can only do in writing because what writing does is it freezes your thoughts onto the page. And now that the thoughts are frozen, you can basically free up space in your memory uh, to basically work with those ideas. It's the same reason that mathematicians have the piece of paper. Yeah. Your teachers always say, use that extra piece of paper when you do math because your brain only has so much storage. And so writing allows you to basically externalize that thinking. David, thank you for having me down to Austin today. Thanks for being here, man. I've been to a lot of studios. This is by far the coolest studio I've been to. I've watched a ton of your videos and I've always been like, where is he doing this? So it's a treat to be here today. Thanks for coming. I want to start with a story that you told me on the way up the mountain in Colorado. And I was like, what'd you do during the summers? And you were like, my dad sent me to public speaking camp. Mm -hmm. So first off, why did your dad send you to public speaking camp? Maybe a little bit more about your dad and then why do you think that was something that was pivotal pivotal in your life? Yeah, it was really pivotal. So my dad always said, I'm going to teach you how to speak really well, and it's going to serve you for your, for your whole life. And it happened sort of sequentially. One of the things that we had in our high school was we had this morning meeting. I went to a super strange high school. We had this morning meeting and the entire high school, 300 people would get together in the same room and it was structured in three parts. First, there'd be an announcements section. Then you would give a talk to the entire school and then everybody at the school would meditate together in the exact same room. <laughs> but <laughs> <laughs> okay. it's crazy. Oh, yeah. And uh, <laughs> I would give a lot of those talks. So I got really comfortable throughout high school giving these talks to the entire school. But the reason that I was comfortable doing that was when I was in middle school, I would go to sleepaway camp for public speaking. So it'd be one or two weeks. And all we would do is practice giving a talk. We'd get feedback and critique, give a talk, get feedback and critique. And from a very young age, I learned how to present myself, how to speak in public. And my dad was totally right. That's what I do now. That's what I'm doing right now. And he was really adamant about making sure I did that. What was your dad's background? Like, why did he know that that was something that was important? I'm not sure. But one of the coolest things about my dad was whenever I was passionate or excited about something, he was all in. Yeah. So we didn't do Hanukkah gifts growing up. We didn't do much fancy dinners. Like birthdays weren't a big deal. But like when I was interested in something, he just went all out. So that was baseball. It was golf. It was flying airplanes and it was public speaking. And somehow he got a sense that I had a knack for communication. I also think maybe that's something that he wanted me to be doing. And he really pushed me to do it. And I'm very thankful that he did. Okay. So you actually wanted to go to the camp. This wasn't like, dad, I have to go to camp. I don't think I wanted to go to sleepaway camp. That was a little bit much, right? That's yeah. sort of like, I like water. I don't want to drink a gallon of water. Yeah. And that was like drinking a gallon of water. I didn't like public speaking sleepaway camp. Yeah. But I did like doing the public speaking trainings and I somehow ended up at these camps. But one of the things that was interesting about my parents is they did a lot of things that were really strange, weird, and esoteric. Like I can just tell you, just go boom, 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 like strange stuff. They somehow got found a program where I could fly in the cockpit of an airplane when I was in sixth grade. They sent me off to Spain when I was 15 years old and I lived with the host family there. I went to a, a sleepaway camp called Embry-Riddle. It was another aviation camp and it was only for teenagers, but I was like 10 years old. So I was the youngest <laughs> person by four years and I just got bullied like crazy. It was brutal. But the thing that they did was they put me in positions that were strange and that were very uncomfortable in a fairly loving way, but it was difficult. And then the other thing was I was the youngest person to be doing things all the time. And so if you, in moments like that, if you were, I don't know if you were, would complain or you would kind of show that, man, I'm the youngest, this isn't going around. Like, how would they react? Would they would just kind of like suck it up or did they, were they happy that you were not happy, but 
they they saw the the benefit of putting you in like a tough situation. I'm not sure, but I was a difficult kid. I was a really, really difficult kid. Even now when people come over and they hear stories, I need to cover my ears and people go, that was you. I was really angry. I was red with rage. And I, I was a tough kid to raise. I used to hit my parents. I used to, I spent a lot of time just being really unhappy. And I think they were trying to figure out what to do with me. Interesting, Dude. That's not the day that I know. I've changed a lot. I was uh, I was a really unhappy child. Well, it's funny. You read, you're obviously motivated, you're ambitious, um, you're a world changer in your own regard. You, our buddy David Senra that does Founders, like you read about part of the gifts that you have come with the dark side. And the dark side, I don't think for people that maybe are wired the way guys like you and I are entrepreneur types or ambitious types. The dark side can be dark. Yeah. I, I, I think I had a lot of fairly dark thoughts, surprisingly young. And I needed to work that out. I feel like I still do need to work that out. Yep. Well, interestingly enough, your hero is Walt Disney. I love Walt Disney. Who's uh, not maybe uh, as a young kid that maybe was uh, rebellious and and uh, into mischief. Why was Walt Disney your hero growing up? So Walt wasn't my hero growing up. Okay. He became my hero like three years ago. Okay. And, <laughs> <laughs> okay. and so this is what's interesting. I'm not that into Disney movies. So like when adults go to Disneyland, they're, you know, they wear the costumes and stuff like that. I'm not like that. I think Walt is a hero for me in two places. One is the way that he merged business and imagination and fused those things together to create really memorable experiences for people. And the other thing is his sense sense of vision around architecture. So the main piece in the lounge in here is a drawing that he made over a period of 40 hours with an artist named Herb Ryman. And what they did was they sat down. This was in the mid-50s as Walt was thinking about, hey, this Disneyland idea might work. And he walked around the room, as legend has it, and just recited what he wanted this park to look like. And he had done multiple trips to Europe. He was really interested in architecture. One of my favorite books is Walt Disney and the way that he got inspiration from 18th and 19th century French interior design, super esoteric and sort of strange. But he sort of pulled all that together into this very distinct vision. And I have that painting just as a reminder of how great things can come from the imagination and how wonder and joy and enthusiasm can come together and how there's these certain moments where there's almost like a divine presence in there and the muses come in and you can create something that's just really magnificent. And that is sort of like the founding story of Disneyland. And I try to just look at it every day when I come into work to just say, all right, let's go create something like that. So the reason that I love Disney is so different from why most people do. And I didn't really develop an appreciation for him until until three years ago or something. Did you? Now I go to Disneyland multiple times per year. I freaking love Disneyland. Seriously? I love Disneyland. I'll go with, so I, I'll, I'll go with friends and that's sort of an architecture type thing. And then what I love doing is I love just going with my friend's kids and you watching and how it's, yeah, I go, I, I, I've i gone last two Thanksgiving with, with uh, Brent Beachhorn and his family and his kids and the girls get so excited. And the fact that he created something that can do that for, millions and millions of people every year, I think is outstanding. Do you think there's a Walt Disney on the planet today? Depends how you define that. Yeah. You think there's people that, because I'm going to tie that into something that I think it's your most viral tweet of all time. The logos one, which was the logos one, which is basically, you just said we're, we're losing our soul in basically everything. Every logo is turning into the same thing. And then you did this, you basically laid it out. And if you haven't uh, read it, you should go read it. But I read, I was reading it this week and it's basically your message is like, we're losing soul and creativity. We I totally think. are. Yeah. So was that, was discovering that part of discovery? Cause it was around the same time you were, I guess saying you started loving Walt Disney. 
Yeah. So what happened was I went to Paris. I did a trip to Paris in May of 2022. I'd never been and visiting Versailles and visiting the museums there and going to the Louvre, just even seeing the bridges and the construction of the city itself, I was so moved by the man-made beauty that's in Paris. And I think that that sent me on this journey of discovery. And then actually, as I was designing the studio, I started <clears throat> right after I got from Paris, or I got back from Paris. And what happened was it's a Friday afternoon. It's like 1 p.m. And I had called up a friend and I said, hey, do you know a good designer? As Faye would have it, she said, oh, yeah, my best friend in Austin's a designer. You'll love working with her. So she comes in and she's on these like, you know, five inch heels. And she's like a combination of Miss Frizzle meets Anna Wintour on acid. <laughs> and, <laughs> and she comes on in and, you know, she's just sort of all over the place. And we start talking about design and we're working together to to develop what the studio would eventually become. And she looks at me and she goes, I've never met somebody like you. You have such a strong sense of what you want, but you have absolutely no sense for the history of art and design and no ability to articulate what it is that you like. And then in this very sort of, she, she goes, thankfully, I am, you know, I've been graced, you know, so I can help you do this. And she really helped me put words to what I, to what I wanted. And all this is to say, I got into it through that, through really building out this studio. And I do think that there's a bunch of opportunity right now to create beautiful things. And a lot of how culture moves is in swings and seesaws. But I do think that at the level of society at large, there's a lot of grays, there's a lot of flat surfaces, there's very few textures, all the new homes that are built basically have flat white walls. It's incredibly boring and dull and stale and I think kind of reflects a lot of the SSRI world that we live in. But at the same time, there are such incredible tools for expression and people feel when they're in the presence of something that is well-made or well-designed, they do come alive. And I think that there's a lot of opportunity there to go out and really crush it, knock it out of the park with good design. You just said something that landed so well. And somebody told me this the other day, I'm really good at telling you what I don't like. Mm -hmm. I'm not great at then coming back going, this is what I want. I can, but when I see it, I know it, Yeah, but I, it's hard for me to get the person where I want them. I just know. One of the most influential pieces of management philosophy that I've read is there's a old PDF called the 11 laws of show running yep. and it's written for actors. And one of the core things is that if you are managing a team of creatives, you cannot say, I'll, I'll know it when I see it. You can't do it. You have to be able to articulate what it is that you want. So how do you do that? Well, when it comes to writing, I collect great paragraphs. When it comes to YouTube thumbnails, I collect great thumbnails. Yeah. When it comes to design, I have hundreds, now thousands of images that I've collected. And so what I do is I try not to even articulate what it is I'm going for. I try to just create a triangle. And if you want to improve your writing, if you want to communicate anything, I just think of the triangle where you say, here are three things that I think are really good. And then you write one sentence that you like about all three things. And then you say, now be inside the triangle. So now you have a quality barometer and you have, you give them a sense of vision and then you don't have to come up with anything, but you're just using examples of things that you found to then give direction to other people. Is there a purpose for it being a triangle instead of like a square or something? Or is there some- A square works, but okay. three is like a nice okay. a nice thing and a triangle so easy to see, so easy to write. Every time I've asked you for something, you always send me like a mood board. Yeah. Like you have, it's like on command. You've sent me podcast studio ideas, thumbnails. How many of those, do you just start dropping things in for different parts of your life? Like totally. How many mood boards do you have? I have so many mood boards. I have so many images. I have so much that I've collected and I'm super sensitive to what do I love and what do I hate? What do I love and what do I hate? And if I see something that I love, I ask, why do I love it? I deconstruct, I try to figure out what is it that is going on here that is making me feel this way. So for example, you ever listen to Theo Vaughn? 
He's the best. He's so funny, He's right? Best. He's so funny. <laughs> so what I'll do is I, I've probably listened to 100 hours of Theo Vaughn in the last two months. And what I do is I just listen to Theo Vaughn and then I just write, what is it that makes Theo Vaughn resonate with me so much? So I'll do my own deconstruction. I'll find little things. For example, just make up sentences. I'll make up words. And then what I do is I say, from there, I then go into the YouTube comments and I say, what are other people saying? that they love about Theo Vaughn. And then I take all that and I say, okay, now I have like a model of why Theo Vaughn speaks so well. And I'm always doing that for things that I find. So those are things that I love. And then also I pay attention to what are things that other people love that I have no affinity for whatsoever. And then I say, why don't I like it? What is the thing that's sort of rubbing me the wrong way? So- well, I have to ask, like, what's one thing that you figured out about Theo Vaughn that the typical listener, like, wouldn't just pick up on? They just think this is a funny guy. What's something that you've, like, drilled in on? They're like, here's a layer deeper if you think about it. He's able to weave together sentences that have never been said before in human history. And he he's able to make up words. So, for example, <laughs> I actually got to credit Sean Puri about this because we we're talking about this. But one of the things that Sean observed is that, so say that he's talking about um, Diet Coke. He'll say, you know, that big old bubbly drink. Or he'll say, you know, that Warren Buffett right hand. And then he'll say, you know, that red and, that red silver soda, you know? And then he'll like say all these different things that then lead you to Diet Coke. And you're like, you kind of know exactly what he's talking about, but you also have no idea what he's talking about. Yeah. And all those things you've never heard somebody say that red and bubbly soda for like Diet Coke. And it's hilarious. All right, let's talk about you've you've kind of been touching on writing. Let's let's it would it would be hard not to talk about writing in this podcast for a bit. So you grew up, uh, we'll call it rebellious. When did you start? Was writing a therapy for you? Not was, at all. Okay, not at all. So how did writing become a thing? So I was a terrible writer growing up. I basically I remember reading. Sula by Toni Morrison, my sophomore year of high school, yeah. raising my hand and saying, "Miss Cohen, this is the first full book I've read in my entire life. So I didn't read. I didn't write at all. And then when I got to college, I I was the sports director for our college television station. So I'd have to write a script for that. And, but still, it wasn't much. And then my first job, I was working in sales. And I remember we were doing this pitch for a Bacardi deck. And I was like, got to really sell this thing. And I wrote the word epic. And my boss calls me into his office and goes, we don't use the word epic here. Take that college language out. And he looks at me and he says, you, your writing is your biggest weakness. You got to improve it. So I remember he's like the six, four guy, super tall. I'm like this, you know, this, you know, the way that I remember in my head, I'm like three feet tall. I'm like, look it up at this guy. It's like this, you know, giant human. And he's confident and big beard and he's just like six four he's like this guy can sell you know i'm super intimidated i'm like well 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 how do i how do i learn to write and he's like well you read good writers you just gotta practice i'm like okay and i ended up getting laid off from the job like a month later and so something about the story that i told i was just like dejected and here i am living in new york city I'm totally hopeless at this point. I'm 22 years old. I've gotten fired, laid off from a job. Who knows? And it's because I didn't know how to write. I was, oh, my goodness. So then <laughs> <laughs> around this time, I was spending a lot of time on Twitter and I said, well, I got to start getting a job. And the way that I learned was I would read people who were writing on the Internet. They were totally normal people. And I said, well, they're writing, they're sharing their ideas. What if I learned how to write? I could do that. So what I did was I said, I'm going to go to Starbucks every single day for 90 minutes and I'm going to get my 90 minutes of writing done. And that's what I started doing. And I did a really poor job of it, but day in and day out, day in and day out. And almost two years to the day later, I got like my first big client who wanted to learn how to write for me. It was a consulting client. It was like $1,000. And I was like, $1,000 for somebody to learn writing from me. And then I decided to turn that from a consulting business into a course business. And now I'm like, well, if other people are paying me to do this, well, I got to get really good at it. And here we are five or six years later. And I guess I've gotten pretty good at it. 
Was there a moment in that first two years where you go, I'm I'm actually good at this? Because you started with like, I just got fired. I'm a loser, blah, blah, blah. (laughs) No, no, but I will tell you a funny story. So there's one thing that I remember happened. So I published a piece called Naked Brands, and I will never forget Patrick O'Shaughnessy sharing it. And I was such a big fan of Patrick. And 6,000 people had read it. And I remember I was at the gym. I ran up the stairs like I just won the Super Bowl. So you wrote a you wrote an essay, put it out on Twitter, and Patrick read it and shared it somehow, some way. Okay, but in that two year period, because again, I think a lot of people are listening to this right now, and they're like, "I suck at writing." Yeah, and maybe they're not going to have the time to dedicate ninety minutes every day. But was there an inflection point or an aha moment that maybe nobody else saw, where you walked away one morning and you're like, "Okay, I'm getting the hang of this." I think that it was slightly different. What what I think I learned how to do was get really captivated by an idea yep. and let that idea consume me. And I remember feeling that for a piece called What the Hell is Going On? We're at our Thanksgiving dinner table. And we're talking about what's wrong with the world. And one aunt's got her opinion. You know, one grandpa has his opinion. Dad has his opinion. Mom has her sister and all these sorts of people. And I'm just sitting there quietly and I'm like, all of you are dead freaking wrong, dead freaking wrong. You have no idea because the thing is you're thinking about this through the lens of the mainstream media, but the media environment has changed and anyone can write, anybody can publish now. And we're moving to a world where the three little net, the three letter networks, CBS, NBC, ABC, Fox, they're not going to have the monopoly on distribution that they used to have. And once media gets democratized and you have these individual creators, the way that we think about media, the way that we think about politics, education, commerce, it's going to totally change. And it was all downstream from shifts in information flow. And I had read the history of media looking at, for example, how the radio led to a lot of totalitarianism what the printing press did with Martin Luther. You know, we've studied this a lot in school. And I said, actually, the same thing is now happening with the internet. There's going to be a crazy fragmentation and that is going to change how we engage with the world. So I wrote that piece and I remember diving in. I was reading Martin Gurry's Revolt to the Public at the time and taking a question like that and having this sort of epiphany moment that is foggy and it's hard to put to words and you have this intuitive sense that there's something interesting there and then putting it into words and sharing it and having people read it that to me is like an intoxicating feeling like i'm drunk every single time i get that feeling it's my favorite thing ever and so it wasn't necessarily that i was a great writer but what i learned how to do was take a question and turn into an answer and that whole process falling in love with it was a really big game changer for me and is that just tons of research, cram, doing your cut, maybe triangle method of saying like, here are all the things I can gather around this topic. And then you just start working it together and working it together. Bunch of research. Yes. Yeah, so that's what it was. It was basically, we'll get a bunch of research. We'll synthesize it in all these sorts of ways. And that's actually how my writing started at the beginning. I really struggled to take ideas for myself and put them onto the page. But what I was good at was taking ideas from other people and put them onto the page. So I called that writing from abundance. So basically I would read a bunch. I'd get say 10,000 words on the page and then I'd almost try to like squish it together and then create something that was the output. That was the ultimate synthesis. And even now I'm quite good at that. But a lot of my more recent writing has been around how do I take things from within me and experiences that I've had, things that I've been through, insights that I've come up with, and how do I then get those onto the page without relying so much on anecdotes and quotes and things from other people? Does every output that you have take about the same amount of time? Or there's some you're like, I wrote that in a day. Oh, yeah. That one took me a year. Yeah, some will kill you. But, but to the reader, they might read both of them and think like they wouldn't be able to tell the difference of how much time was put into each one. Yeah. And what's the difference? Well, one thing is as a writer, one of the most important things is getting comfortable with deleting things that took you a lot of time. 
Mm-hmm. And knowing that just because something took you a lot of time doesn't mean it's more insightful. All right. So you figured out you're good at writing. You run up the the elevator. Patrick shared your deal. And then at that point, you thought, OK, I'm going to start turning this into a business. Other people yeah. should start writing. Yep. Why do you think other people should start writing? So there's a few reasons. First is writing improves your thinking. There are so there have been so many moments in my life when I've thought that I've had a sense of what was going on. And writing made me realize that I didn't know what I was talking about. And it also allowed me to structure my ideas. And there's a certain kind of thinking that you can only do in writing. Because what writing does is it freezes your thoughts onto the page. And now that the thoughts are frozen, you can basically free up space in your memory Uh to basically work with those ideas. It's the same reason that mathematicians have the piece of paper. Yeah. Your teachers always say, use that extra piece of paper when you do math because your brain only has so much storage. And so writing allows you to basically externalize that thinking. So that's the first reason to improve your thinking. The second reason is that we are writing now more than ever. There's this idea that the written word is disappearing and going away. And I see why people say that, but it's also not true. We're writing a bunch of emails. You write you write a bunch of memos at work. You're texting our friends all the time. And There's a bunch of people who learn to write in school in this way that is very rigid and stultified, and they sound awkward and robotic when they try to write. Don't do that. Don't do that. But you need to untrain yourself from doing that. And if you can, then you can be the person at work who writes the company memo and you're setting the strategy. You can be the person at work that when you see an idea, then you can email it to the CEO and you can say, hey, we should reconsider this. We should change how things are. And I'm telling you, any company in the world, from Disney to Stripe to Apple, if you see something, like say that you work at Apple, you work on a supply chain in 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 China, and you see something that is consistently happening with the iPhones that if if it was solved, it would create many millions of dollars a year in in an increased profit for Apple. Well, I guess you could go t- tell your boss and whatever, and maybe would get up the chain, but then you'd have the game of telephone or you can take a weekend. You can sit down to write what you see and you can send that email to Tim Cook. He will read that email. He will read that email. So writing is your fast track to the top and smart people read and smart and successful people read the most. The people who are running the world don't wake up every morning and watch Mr. Beast. They wake up every morning <laughs> and they Sorry, read stuff. They read stuff. I mean, I like, you know, Mr. Beast is great, but like they read stuff. And then the other thing is I encourage people to share their ideas because if you share your ideas, then you can increase your surface area for serendipity. And that's when really magical things happen that you wouldn't have expected. People reach out that you don't know. There's people want to work with you. People want to be friends with you. Most of my friends come through online writing in some way, shape, or form. And what you're doing is you're tapping a tuning fork and you're seeing what resonates. So you're saying, hey, this is what I'm interested in. This is what I'm excited about. And the more specific and rigorous it can be, the more that you attract people on your intellectual wavelength. It can be so hard to find those people in the physical world but it's so easy to attract those people when you share your ideas online. Why do you say that uh, people write better in text messages than in Google Docs? It's true, right? Why do you say that? So I think that there's a few things. I think that there's a conditioning thing where we're, we think that you're going to open a computer. You sort of open it. You sort of look at that blank white screen, that flashing cursor of doom. And you're like, okay, now I need to be polished and rigid. And so what happens is, You turn on the part of your brain that sort of needs to be perfect and polished. And that really blocks people. There's something about typing in a text message box and the blue bubbles and that really makes people just feel like they're talking to friends. And I find that it's surprisingly effective that if you're stuck, you can just change the context. Hey, if you're stuck, just text me something. I know so many people who many years ago, there was a woman who took Rite of Passage and she sent an email to me and she was like, I don't think this is the right thing for me. You know, like investigating the program, like she's an FBI detective or something. And I'm like, <laughs> like hold on here. Okay. And it was so well written. It's like, here are the six reasons why I'm skeptical of you and your program. And I'm like, okay, cool. 
and <laughs> <laughs> just an utter teardown. And so we get back to her. She ends up joining. So it's five weeks later. She's getting to the end of the program. She's about to publish her final piece and she get another email. Hey, I can't, I can't publish this piece because I'm not a good writer. And I'm like, Emily, you're a great writer. You sent me that email beforehand that was well thought through. The word choice was very carefully done. But now that you're trying to write to the masses, now you're stuck. If you just write me an email, you'll be good. So take your piece, write me an email. She did, ended up being good, changed a few things, shipped it off. So you've had 1,500 or so people go through it? Yeah. What's like one thing that, what what have people gone on to do since coming out of that program? That oh, maybe yeah. started like Emily, where they didn't think they were a good writer. What's a story of somebody that's come out that maybe people would know about? My favorite example is Packy McCormick. Packy okay. was working, he was the VP of experience at Breather, and he was totally stuck in his career. And he's like, what am I? I'm not super satisfied with what I'm doing. I feel like I have a lot of potential staring at the walls, you know, doing that thing at work where you sort of sneak off to the bathroom just to like, you know, get a few, a few minutes away from the desk. And he knew that he was made to be doing something more. And he was really interested in Ben Thompson and business theory, but he was reading it and he was like, this is so boring. This is so boring. And he comes in to write a passage. He starts writing and trying to think about what he's going to do. And he says, what I'm going to do is I'm going to write about business and tech and what's happening right now, but I'm not going to do it in the boring way. I'm going to layer on pop culture references and humor and playfulness, and I'm going to call it not boring. And that's what he's done. I think he now has 200 to 250,000 email subscribers. He published his very first email newsletter, his very first article on Reddit Passage, and his goal for the first newsletter was to get just 20 subscribers. And he was like, please, 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 please. And he's now he's now grown that by an order of magnitude. That dude went through Rite of Passage. He was in our first cohort. Did he think he was a good writer going into it? I don't know. I think that he knew he had potential, but yeah. he had never written anything. All right, let's do a little bit of storytelling. Okay. You go to Patrick Collison's of it. And, and, to, and to cheat, you gave me a list of stories that I thought were awesome. And so there, there, there could be some rhythm to these. We'll weave them in and out. Cool. But the first one out the gate, you said this was a great story. I went to Patrick Carlson's a bit. Yeah. So I, another person who I met through the internet, I remember Patrick sent me a direct message and said, hey, you want to have lunch next time you're in San Francisco? And I'm a huge fan of Patrick Carlson. And I said, yes, let's do it. So... We met, we had lunch, and then I get an email probably about a, nine months later, and it says, hey, I'm hosting an event. Uh, do you want to come up? And so basically what he did, it was at Sea Ranch, and he brought in 150, 200 people who he knew through the internet or scientists, different writers, all together. And I'll never forget, I showed up and I get this card. And it basically says, hey, welcome to Sea Ranch Camp. And there's eight things on the card. It's like, hey, here's where you're going to sleep. Here are the meal times. Here are the event times. And all this standard stuff. But the eighth bullet point, I will never forget. Because I think that it is the epitome of what makes Patrick so distinct and the kind of thinking that you need to build a great company. The eighth bullet point says, and if anything isn't impeccably perfect, let me know immediately. If anything isn't impeccably perfect, let me know immediately. And I've thought about that sentence a lot over the years. And there's two things that really stand out. The second thing is let me know immediately, which is you talk to me. Like, I want to know. Back to the writing thing, like, you let me know. I'm writing this event come talk to me. It's not go talk to somebody else, talk to me. And then the first thing, impeccably perfect, I think is a really gentle way of set, of setting an extremely high standard. It's not, eh, if you're annoyed by anything, it's not, if anything doesn't feel right, it's like, we want this event to be impeccably perfect. And if it's not, let me know. And I think that one of Patrick's 
best traits is he's able to be very bold and ambitious, but in a gentle and very human way. Mm -hmm. And I thought that that sentence just embodied that perfectly. Bold and ambitious with a dose of gentle is, is hard to pull off. Totally. Most people that are super bold and ambitious lack empathy and grace too. Yeah. That kind of comes with it. All right. You bet Brent B. Shore. <laughs> How'd you meet Brent? Meeting Brent was one of the best things that ever happened to me. And how'd you meet him? Writing? No. So Brent did a podcast with Patrick O'Shaughnessy. And I listened to the podcast and I said, this guy is the smartest mind on business I've ever come across. I said, I need to reach out to him. So I did. I said, hey, let's do a podcast. And at the time I had, now I have a podcast called How I Write. But at the time I had this little one called North Star. And I was sort of trying to figure out what I want to do with my life. Basically, after I'd gotten laid off, I said, I'm going to start a podcast called The North Star because I got to figure out what is my North Star? Like, where am I even going with my life? I have no idea. And I reach out to Brent and I say, hey, let's do a podcast. And I'll never forget, I recorded it in a little stairwell at my friend's office. And we ended up, I guess he ended up enjoying it. And he invited me to, to Missouri to stay with him. And I went to go talk about business and making money. And he ended up wanting to talk about Jesus. And I think we'll end up talking about faith later on. And basically, I left with a really simple idea from Brent, which was, dude, you can think whatever you want about faith. I totally respect it. But if you're going to reject Jesus, you're going to need some better answers. And I said, yeah, you're totally right. Those are lame answers. So I met him and now he's like, one of my best friends. What do you remember? What were your answers at the time? Were oh, they just like, it, yeah, I mean, I mean they were so bad. Were they just convenient? Like, yeah. I mean, I basically thought that Jesus was like worshiping a sky fair. It's like you can worship the build a bear that you built at the workshop in sixth grade, or you can worship Jesus and they're like on the same plane and dimension. And also, I thought that all Christians were lame and stupid. And I had no respect for Christianity itself. That was probably a function of having met very few Christians where I grew up and then living in New York City at the time. But I was just like, there's no way I'm going to do that. It just felt like the lamest thing to be a Christian. Okay. We're going to, we're going to weave back there. We've, we've kind of set the, the tone, but we'll get there in a second because this is a story I, I think that needs to be told. Dude's working at McDonald's. Oh yeah. <laughs> How'd you find this guy? His name's the cultural tutor. <laughs> he, is he the most prolific writer on Twitter now or one of them? So so basically, I have scrolled around the world and back with my left index finger on Twitter. So yeah. like when I see somebody on Twitter, I have a pretty good sense for how much game they have. You're a, you're a left index finger? I'm a right thumber. I think I'm a left index okay. finger guy. You know? <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> you know, who knows? And um, so you've scrolled around the world. Yeah. And I've just, it's funny, I can read like two to four sentences from somebody and I can, if you just give me that much, I can't, I can very quickly see if somebody's a great writer. Like it doesn't, it's just the word choice, the word, the the sentence construction. And there was this guy, cultural tutor, who I'd been following and he was just exploding. You know, one week he has 10,000 followers. Next week he has 30, 70, 80, hits a hundred thousand followers six weeks in. And I see, I remember seeing joined in May. It is now mid June, you know, late June. And he has a hundred thousand and he writes this thread and he's basically saying, Hey, I've hit a hundred thousand followers to celebrate. I'm going to launch my newsletter. Like that's the worst flipping idea I've ever heard. You're growing super fast because you're sharing all your stuff for free. Now you're going to do a paid subscription newsletter. He's like, well, I need some many as he calls it. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> So I can write about culture and then I'm like, that's the worst idea ever, but I don't know who this guy is. He's a statue account. Who is the cultural tutor? And as fate would have it, at the bottom, there's this guy, Harry Dry, who responds with a photo, this like blurry, weird, sort of distorted photo of the two of them. And it says, proud of you, brother. And I had had dinner with Harry in London earlier that year. So I instantly send Harry a WhatsApp. I'm like, yo, you need to introduce me to cultural tutor right now. 
And he's like, whoa, 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 <laughs> you know, what's going on? I'm like, okay, this is what's happening. He just said 100,000. I'd like to chat with him. Who is he? So I get on uh, FaceTime with Cultural Tutor. I'm like, who are you? He's like, well, 25 years old, just left my job at McDonald's. I was like sweeping the floors, cleaning out the McFlurry machines. I was like lower on the totem pole than the guy who flips burgers. And it wasn't really my passion, what I feel like I was made to be doing. So I decided to start writing and I'm living with my parents, sort of a tough situation right now. And I'm training for the British military because either I'm going to make money as a writer or go to the military. And I'm like, hold on here. Hold on here. So you have no job. He's like, I have no job. I'm like, you have no money. He's like, I have no money. And I say, well, what if I just paid you to to write? How much would you need? And he goes, well, I would need 2,000 pounds a month. I'm like, that's not a lot. We'll give you a little bit more than that and we'll just... Called a deal. Here's the rule. Write a Twitter thread every single day and try to grow your email newsletter. He now has like 200,000 subs on the newsletter, 1.6 million followers, and has just taken the world by storm. And why is he so great? Like, why was he the guy that you lasered in on and just knew it in four sentences? So here's why. There's a lot of people who write about culture. There's a lot of people who write really engaging stuff. There's not a lot of people who do both. And what he did was he took ideas from copywriting and internet writing and layered them on to writing about 14th century Rome or the Scottish Enlightenment. And he is the first person that I know of who really embraced copywriting techniques in writing about culture. And because of that, his writing has this spice and a sense of aliveness that almost no one in his space does. I, I would imagine back in the day, if you were a great writer, the goal was to to write books. Is that fair or no? Like, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Is that still the goal of every great writer? And now it's just like right on the internet. Has that has that been changed because we have the internet? I would say I used to think that the answer was a yes, and now I think the answer is no. I've been corrected by on that take from watching people who I know well publish a book. A book still has a cultural cachet and a weight and a gravitas to it that writing on the internet doesn't have. And I think that writing on the internet is a great way to get started. It's a great way to meet people. It's a great way to test your ideas. It's a great way to get to get ideas out there. But there is something about a book that is di- that is distinct and has not gone away with the internet at all. You know what the something is, or it's just kind of the the magic fairy dust. Well, I think that the thing is, it's just that people look at a book. You can look at it. You can touch a book, and like you're everybody from your cousin to like that weird person who you knew in high school who you haven't spoken to in thirty years. They both have a sense of oh, that book is is there's something to it. Whereas writing on the internet is sort of this strange thing for people who are uniquely curious, whereas everybody understands a book. Everybody owns books. Okay, back to books. Yeah. So you meet Brent, you give him these kind of shoddy answers. He kind of tells you, <laughs> he kind of tells you that's not good enough. But I think the thing I respect most about getting to know who you are is you didn't just set it on the table and just kind of move on in life. It kind of, you're like, all right, I'm at least going to go prove myself right or wrong. And you've written maybe your best piece ever was proving yourself wrong. Yeah. So what did the next day, the next weeks, like how did that kind of shift begin to happen where you basically said, I'm going to go prove that Jesus happened or didn't happen. Right. Well, the way that it was framed in my head then, and I still think, it now is that what you do with Jesus, who you think Jesus is, is one of the most important questions in the world. Interesting. Either the story of Jesus is 100% true. He's the son of God, died for our sins. And I think that if you think that that's true, you fall over and you worship. Or the story of Jesus is the greatest scam in human history. There are billions of people who worship at the altar of this guy, 
And in the book of 2 Corinthians, Paul writes that if Jesus has not died and been resurrected, we, of all people, as Christians, we should be pitied for doing the things that we do. So it's either a scam or the ultimate truth. And I'm like, Sherlock Holmes time. I'm putting my detective hat and I'm getting to work. Let's you know go. what I mean? Because it can only be one or the other. Yep. And that was so exciting to me. Okay. But what did you do? So mm. so what happened was, <laughs> <laughs> so what happened was I was living in New York at the time. And I started going to Tim Keller's lecture. So he, when he was live, he did this series called Questioning Christianity. And they were so good because what he would do is he would do these lectures on ideas like faith, uh, hope, justice, identity. And he would really respect the secular atheist argument of people like me who are living in New York. And he would say, I hear where you're coming from. And he was very forthright about saying, I believe that Christianity has better answers to all of these seven, eight things that I've laid out. And I'm going to try to persuade you otherwise, while also really respecting that no matter where you are, there's a leap of faith. But no matter where you are, there's a leap of faith is a super insightful sentence for me. Okay. Because no matter where you are, what he showed me was that the secular worldview that I had required a lot of faith that I wasn't appreciating and understanding. So that any worldview requires leaps. There's no null place that you can be where there's no faith required. It's not like, oh, the secular thing is just the right thing. And then what we just do is we just make a bunch of stuff up and then we go become Christians. I mean, no matter where you are, you're going to have to take that leap. And there was a book I read which just with the best title. I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. And I was like, whoa. So Tim <laughs> Keller, that book. And then I realized, okay, now that I've sort of loosened the screws of my, of my atheism, now let's look into what Christianity is. Well, I would go to Europe and I'd say, these are the most beautiful buildings and works of art I've ever seen. We're not producing things like this now. There's no way. I'm looking at the painting that's done. I'm looking at the buildings here in Austin. They don't look anything like the things that I see in Europe. So I'm like, hold on. It's not just the know-how of architecture. It is the underlying worldview of those people who built that beautiful architecture. And they worshiped God. They weren't secular people. They were driven by a religious conviction. And I looked at that and I said, well, hold on. Why don't I look into even just how America is is structured? And we learn about the Declaration of Independence, which says, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. What a great sentence. All men are created equal. These truths, they're self-evident. Wait, hold on. They're not self-evident at all. The next sentence says, we are endowed by our creator with inalienable rights. And I go, oh my goodness, wait, they're only self-evident because we're endowed by a creator that is the creator that gives us these, 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 these rights. So hold on. That means that if I don't believe in God, the entire apparatus of my morality is going to fall. It's going to disappear. So either I need to reconstruct my morality from scratch, build a whole new moral framework, or I got to worship Christ. And so now I'm, now I'm just freaking out. Now I'm freaking out, right? I'm just like, everything I've lived on is a lie or I got to go become one of these Christian guys. And I didn't want to do that either because I didn't like Christian people. And uh, so that was the work that I did. And so I was loosening the screws of my atheism, really coming to appreciate the influence of Christianity on the West, which I which I love, and then coming to faith at the end. So it's sort of a three-part series. And how long did that take? Five years. And you wrestled until the end. I'm still wrestling, man. I mean, I'm still wrestling. Sure. I mean, Israel means to wrestle with God. And the only difference is I wrestle now, I wrestle then, but now I don't wrestle with doubt. I wrestle with my relationship with God. Yeah. Whereas before I wrestled with, does God exist? 
and that wrestling just being kind of maybe what we were talking about earlier. It's just, it's, you don't become a Christian to have the easy life and it's perfect in utopia. You learn it to build a foundation with how to deal with difficult things in life, suffering, suffering, dying to yourself. It's the only, it's the only thing I've found where I can make meaning out of suffering rather than seeing it as a waste of a life. Yeah. And it says, uh, I'm going to botch where in the Bible it is, but you should find joy in your suffering. James one verses two and three count it all joy. My brothers, when you face trials of various kinds for the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. I love that line. And that's, uh, that's the basically anti where we are today as a society in America, finding joy in your sufferings right now. It's find somebody to blame for your sufferings yeah. rather than take accountability for them. Yep. I need to read that book. What was it called? I, I, I don't have enough faith. Yeah. Somebody told me once is like, I don't have, uh, it was something about, it takes a lot of faith to be an atheist. It takes a lot of faith to believe in any worldview. Um, and I think that that's just the intellectually honest position of any worldview has faith. And so the question when you meet somebody and you ask, what is your faith background is what leaps of faith are you taking in your worldview? You just, and I think you tied this in, but you said, seeing how my entire life was a product of American idolatry. Oh yeah. Can you expand on that? Yeah. So it's funny because I grew up Jewish, went to Hebrew school. I did Judaic studies classes every single day, but I grew up Jewish by culture, which I love. And I grew up Jewish by heritage, which I'm super grateful for. And I grew up, but I did not really grow up Jewish by faith and doctrine. That never really appealed to me. It never just got that grip on me. So I think that it's important to separate those three things because actually when it came to my faith and my doctrine, I was a byproduct of American idolatry, which is very simple. You do well in school so you can go to a good college, go to a college, you do go to a good graduate school. You do that so then you can get a good job so that then you can have like a smoking hot wife and like this sort of iconic family, like a nice golden retriever, drive a Range Rover, and then you can have a white picket fence, live the American dream, and then you can retire at 65 and call it a life. And it is this very... Americanized post World War II way of thinking about the nature of the good life. And I bought into it hook, line, and sinker. I mean, it was every aspect of that was exactly what my life was about. And I obsessed over what college am I going to get into? I was one of those kids who's like, if I don't get into a good school, my life's going to be forever ruined. I was, I worshiped the attractiveness of what, you know, my partner who, you know, who am I going to end up marrying? What's that going to say about me? How much, how well liked am I going to be? So do all the people around me, do they like me? Do they think that I'm great? Well, why don't we just think of my own self-worth and basically the accumulated point total of all the people, like my sense of what all the other people in my life think about me. And the higher that point total, the better, the better I am. Dan, I want to be like remembered in history. I want to change the world. Like, you know, stamp my name in the history books with the things that I've done written down in ink. People, multiple generations will be reading about the great works that I've done. That was the life that I lived. That was the path that I was following. And that is really what I converted from because it had such a hold on my life. And it was good when it was going good. But the second that I started to have some troubles, things inside of Rite of Passage, launching a second company, having that basically just fold. We could never really have that work. Having a relationship with somebody who I thought I was going to marry, watching that fall like a house of cards and getting to a place where I was in such extreme suffering to the point where I was thinking thoughts that I never would have thought that I would have thought. I mean, just the darkest of thoughts. I just couldn't believe it. And At that point, I swear I only saw in black and white for multiple weeks. I struggled to get out of bed in the morning. I struggled to find any sort of meaning and purpose. And 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10 talks about the difference between worldly sorrow and godly sorrow and how worldly sorrow 
essentially leads to sort of a despair and a destruction, but godly sorrow leads to repentance. And that there's a godly sorrow that actually brings you closer to God and that we can find meaning in that. And Psalm 126 makes the same sort of case, but in a very poetic way about how the tears of sorrow, if they're sown in the right way, they can lead to fruits over time. And the combination of both of those two things helped me realize that there's this really funny way that in the Christian story, as you begin to suffer, you get closer to to Christ. I mean, I'm sure that, like, I wonder if you feel it, like when you're in those moments of most difficulty, that's when you're de- most dependent on God. And I think that a lot of the reason that God puts real trials into our life is to remember that we aren't God and that we need to lean on him and totally surrender ourselves and to basically beg. And that is when the most wisdom is revealed. That's when the most knowledge and understanding is given to us. And it's actually in that dependence that this this strange way we're actually in our healthiest state because God is here and man is here. God is above, man is below. And it's when we're in a state of pride, which comes from success, that we end up in these very sort of distorted places. And so it wasn't just my own American idolatry, but watching people, hearing stories of people who win the World Series, they win a Super Bowl, they sell their company. All the time, you meet people who sell their company, and six months later, they're miserable. They're absolutely miserable. And I didn't want that. And I felt so much pain and brokenness and emptiness and despair in my life that eventually I surrendered because I had no other way to live. And I just jumped and God just caught me. Like, I feel like I just jumped and I was just caught with open arms, pulled in and a real sense of depression lifted. And I just haven't, I haven't been the same since. That's unbelievable. It's, um, one way I read that book, Becoming a King, but it it just related. I lost my dad 11 years ago, but it relate. There's a chapter where it just talks about a young child, how dependent they are on their father, the trust they have in their father, just uh, your father giving you a hug, what that can do to you. Um, and then that moment, it made me, it was basically going back to the description of what you just said is in those moments, we need somebody. To, it's on our innate how we are as children to need a father. Um, and for me, it's been the only thing that's taken me out of being at what I'd call a zero in life. I've, I've felt your, the pain you're feeling up, up in there and it sucks. It sucks, but it is a beautiful thing to be able to, um, to just lean on somebody. One of the things that I was at dinner with somebody and I was telling him about this and he said, man, so like life's going great. Like, you know, like you became a believer, like everything's good now, like you're good to go. And I was like, no, man, <laughs> not at all. He's like, well, well, what's the difference? And I said, you still deal with the same kind of suffering. The difference for me is I used to never know where to go. Now I know exactly where to go. I know exactly who to turn to. And I never have to question what is the rock that I can hug onto for dear life anymore. The rock used to change every week, every two weeks. And when I was going through hell in early 2023, I realized that there was no rock that I knew of that could support me. And I was just spiraling. Jamie Winship, I had him on the podcast. He said it, I think he says it best, but if you find your identity in whatever situation you're in on this earth, if the outcome of whatever situation you're in is where you find your identity, high or low, the game's already been lost. Girlfriend, my identity is if we don't get married, I'm a loser. You've lost. If we do get married, I'm a winner. You've lost. You could if my business succeeds, I'm awesome. If it doesn't, I'm a, you know, a loser. 
And and I've, I've played that back through my head so many times. If if the situation you're in and the outcome of that is where you get your identity, the game's been lost before you played it. Ain't that right? And that's a tough. That's a a freeing place uh, to be, um, and it's a tough place to be if 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 that's where you're at. And going back to why it's not easy is you. I, I feel like I bounce in and out of believing that at times. I, yeah, I couldn't say I could sit here today and tell you if something catastrophic happened in my business, it's not gonna be like, well. I'm a Christian. Right. It's going to just be okay. It's like, there's going to be a moment of, of, uh, there's a piece of me that that's at the table and the success of that business. And that's, I'll live the rest of my life trying to not have to have those feelings. Of course it's a, it's a journey, but it gets better. It gets better. Like it's really gotten better for me Yep. in a meaningful way. And also there's something just helpful of being conscious of your idols rather than unconscious of them. And when you're unconscious of them, they are chains, like handcuffs that you walk in. Yep. All right, we're going to do this last piece. On, we'll call it takes. Oh, Because that's what we called it. If people know you love them, you can say anything. Yes. So there's been some studies out there from established universities and psychologists and whatnot. And one of the things that you read is what you should do is like four compliments or five compliments for every like one critique or something like that. Or do the compliment sandwich, you know, start off with a compliment, then like give them the harsh feedback, then end with the compliment. People are like, oh, that's great advice. I was like, oh, that's great advice. I now think it is totally missing the point 100%. And the thing that inspired this was I think it's John 117, which says that Moses brought the law, Jesus brought grace and truth. And what you want is you want full grace and full truth. And as I see it, Full grace and full truth is one of the great definitions of love, where what you're doing is rather than doing this compliment sandwich stuff or anything like that, you can say anything to somebody in terms of a critique or telling them, hey, you can do better th at this, but they need to feel this undercurrent of deep, roaring love. And then you can be direct with them. You can tell them exactly the truth because that is the most loving thing to do. And when people talk to others, they fall on one of two sides. Either they aren't telling the full truth, which isn't loving because they're not like a good friend is an accurate mirror to who you are. It's an uncracked mirror. It's a straight mirror. It is really reflecting what is going on. And they're saying, hey, Chris, hey, David, there's this thing about you. There's that thing about you. And you're just seeing through your friend who you are. And when it's lacking that, you're not getting full truth. But a bunch of people who give you the full truth, they're like that authoritarian dad. They're like, David, why in the world did you do that? You do this, you do this, you do this. And it's all true. But you feel this antagonism. Somebody is just punching you in the face over and over like it's a UFC fight and they're ready to knock you out. And like that is not how we should be engaging as humans. And when people feel that undercurrent of love and that love is really established, and one way to think about love is no matter what you do, there's nothing you can do to make me love you more. And there's nothing you can do to make me love you less. I just love you. And when you really feel that and then somebody gives you the truth, they can say anything. And that to me is like the mark of a good relationship. And to be fair, these are to for listeners, these are your takes that you sent me. These aren't my takes that I'm giving to you. I don't think I said that. These are so like lessons I've heard. If someone from the seven I love this one. If someone from the 1700s came back, they'd first be surprised by all the technology, but then they'd wonder why our society is so age segregated. <laughs> and it made me think like it is kind of weird we always hang out with people kind of around our age. It's really weird. So one of my favorite questions to ask is. Next time you're with someone who doesn't have kids, they live in a city, okay? Ask them, when was the last time that you spent more than 10 minutes with someone with a kid who's not in your family? Most people I've asked this question to will say years or I don't ever remember doing that. 
which is weird, which is weird. Because if you think about how societies used to function, they were just kids there all the time. They were, you know, families and friends, people in the village, like they would just meet each other. They'd spend a bunch of time together. And there's something very pure about children of they really have this like natural joy and playfulness. And I don't think it's a coincidence that a lot of times in scripture, we're told to have the faith of a child. There's yeah. something very simple about it. It is actually adults who, in a very meaningful way, end up distorting things, whether it's because of trauma or idols or whatever it becomes. There's something very pure about kids. And I think that that's why people like being around kids. You know, people will say, oh my goodness, you know, we went out in the fields and like, they got so excited about a four leaf clover. Like I have been that excited about a four leaf clover in forever. And at the same time, you ask people, when was the last time you spent some meaningful time with somebody who's 30 years your senior, who isn't someone who you work with or somebody in your family? And they'll say, never, I, never. I can't think of somebody. And for me, that is the single biggest life cheat code I know of, which is spend a bunch of time with people who are who are wise elders. And I'm super, super intentional about this. So it's Wednesday, right after this, I'm having lunch with a 78-year-old guy who's an elder at one of the churches in town. He runs the prayer ministry there. Bob and I have or together every single week. I am really tight with this guy named Brian who baptized me, who is such a dear friend. And we get lunch together for a few hours every every few weeks. And I just tell him everything. I mean, that guy, like it's an open book. I've said it's an open book, the good things and the bad things. And I've got my struggles. And I'm like, Brian, I'm going to tell you no matter how embarrassing it is. And even last week, inspired by cloud camp, which we did in Colorado last summer. What I did was I hosted a men's retreat for a bunch of young guys in town and brought in all the wise old men I know. And they gave a talk for 90 minutes to two hours, just about what they'd been through, how they think about life. And those moments are so, are so gratifying. They're so rewarding when you find those really, really wise people and they can speak truth into your life. They've been through stuff. They, the ones I like increasingly just have a good relationship with the Lord, but I don't think that that's absolutely necessary. And it's just a cheat code. And I'm like, world, why don't we spend time with the kids who can give us that freshness and these elders who can give us that wisdom? It hit me hard. My best friend is probably 20 years older than I am. Oh, really? And he's like my... I, I don't know if you've met Pete yet. Pete will be at Cloud Camp this summer, but he's uh yeah, he's like my best buddy, but he's like he's he's like a mentor, a best friend, a father figure. I, I talk to him all the time and um it's been one of the best things in my life because what you said, it's like a cheat code. He has kept me out of so much trouble. It's funny because when you're friends with someone that for that long, I've probably been friends with him for twelve years. There's so many things he told me 12 years ago that I was like, yeah, 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 yeah. And I'm living through those right now. Um, so that one hit me hard. I mean, it's the same thing with Brother E every Monday. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, you just get on those calls and hearing him say the other day at 85, I guess he basically was mourning or he was repenting. for. He, this is a guy that's been a pastor for 60 something years, probably lived a life that you could, you and I can't even imagine. And he's still at the end of his life saying it was so obvious how much better I could have done. And you tend to hear that from people when they're old. You never hear, and this is, you know, you never hear work harder, make more money, you know, do all these things. And it's unequivocally the same message from every old person. Yet when you're young, you just kind of realize you, you, you might believe it. You might do some things to kind of pivot, but you don't fully embrace it. Yeah. And I think that what an idol is, is it's giving something an exaggerated importance. And once mm. you have that wisdom, it's like you can see the different facets of life and you know how important certain things are and aren't. For example, young men tend to dramatically overestimate the benefit of business success. 
and tend to dramatically underestimate other things. <laughs> and when you have somebody like that who's been through the cycles, and it's not just been through the cycles, but watched people destroy their lives for whatever sin it is, then it raises the stakes because there's a lot of things where we'll, we will, for example, say that you want to, you know, try some drugs, right? So like you're a young, like young kid, you're like, all right, like let's do some drugs. Like what's the big deal? And then do some drugs and like nothing happens. And you're like, all right, no problem. Let's do it again. Let's do it again. And then somebody says, don't do drugs. And you're like, do drugs? Like not a problem. But then somebody <laughs> says, I hear where you're coming from, but I knew Greg and Greg was exactly in your shoes and Greg was trying to do drugs here. And I'm just going to tell you Greg's story. Greg went from doing these sorts of drugs to then doing those sorts of drugs. And then once he did those sorts of drugs, he was then with, then surrounded himself with those sorts of people who do those sorts of drugs, which then got him drinking. And that whole thing led to the collapse in this way. And I knew Greg really well. So I'm just going to tell you, I hear where you're at, but there's some naivete to what you're saying and having stories like that. And it's not about being fear inducing. Like that's no. not what it's about. That's, that's, that's not it either, but it's just, you watch people who've really seen their lives collapse due to bad decisions. And when they can tell you those things and firsthand experience and deliver it with love, it, it's very clarifying people's willingness to be vulnerable and share their mistakes is what's changed my life mm. unequivocally. I live in, and probably you do too, in a world where most of the people around you tell you what you want to hear. There's not time to tell you the real answers. Every major critical change in my life or what got me to look in the mirror for the first time was hearing somebody that I respected tell me all the bad things about them. And then realizing, oh, wait, it's not just me. And that opened up a whole new door for me. And I think some of that's wisdom. Older people tend to be willing to share a little bit more. Younger people are still mm -hmm. trying to make it. They don't want any blemishes on their resume. They got to get the next job, the next deal. I was as broken as I've ever been, um, you know, years ago. And from the outside, it probably looked like I was the most buttoned up I've ever been. And it's a series of people, most some of whom you know, that just shared this raw honesty and it forever changed my life. Um, and I, my hope for the world, I think more than anything right now, it's something money doesn't have to buy is just people can find somebody that will be vulnerable with them. Yeah. And just tell them you ain't alone. Yeah. 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 For me, I think my equivalent of that is having elders people in my life, friends who can be straight up about where I'm missing the mark. Yep. It is so, so useful. I've had friends say, hey, why are you always, you're super tight when we're together and you're just being yourself. And then all of a sudden you get in front of the audience and now you're not yourself anymore. You're being super performative. Yep. Why is it that, dude, you just lack prioritization all over the place. People saying, hey, you're constantly on the road. And I think that you, you traveling, you're actually running away from something. Mm. Having people say, Hey, I just want to let you know, you just have this tendency to build people up to a level that they can't possibly meet. And when you do that, you're putting them in a position where they feel like they're going to disappoint you and they are going to disappoint you because you're not seeing them clearly. Yeah. Having friends say, hey, whenever a problem comes up, I've noticed you tend to just catastrophize things. You tend to take little problems, think that they're big ones. And I'm just going to tell you, you do this every single time. And those are five things just off the top of my noggin that people have just said to me straight up. And now that I'm aware of those things, I'm like, whoa, you're right. I do that. Oh, my goodness. And I'm haunted. I'm shook by the idea of somebody not telling me that. And I'd have to go my whole life with these unconscious patterns. The catastrophizing thing you just shot right through my heart. little punch in the arm. I can take the tiniest thing and roll and, and run it out years in the making or run the situation out to the absolute worst outcome possible and live there. I agree with you on this one. So much of life is like a jet ski. Uh, looks amazing from far away, but once you do it, it's only fun for a surprisingly short time. <laughs>
I don't know if there's much more to expand on there. Well, it's true. I mean, how many things do you... I'm I'm just very struck by the emptiness that comes on the far side of success for a lot of people, where you sell a company, you become miserable. I mean, it's funny, like, I saw a photo of this sort of McMansion called the middle of Ohio. There was no one who lived anywhere close by. And this couple doesn't have kids. They just have this giant house. And I just look at that. I'm like, jet ski. Yeah. You get that. Yeah. And cool. <laughs> and then you're like two months in and you're like, oh my goodness, we have to maintain this thing. We're going to be super lonely. I heard a line from David Brooks many years ago where he says, us Americans, we get wealthy and we buy loneliness where we move away from people. We get in these big houses. We're nowhere close to anybody. And that line haunted me. And I think that there's just a bunch of things in life that are jet skis. And this is just the fundamental bug in human OS is thinking that once we get that next meal, once we get that next thing, once we get that next girl, we that that will satisfy us. And it never does. And yet every single day we have to wake up and that's a lot of what spiritual life is about is just knowing it's like a constant reminder that that next thing won't won't give you that sense of eternal satisfaction so then the question is what are the things that you have that then do and for me i think it's different for everybody but for me the if i can bring it down to one word it's relationships it's friendship yep. like friendship relationships are the greatest things and having a small group of friends who you're just all in on, you know them, they know you. And I think that hopefully once I have a family, I'll say the same thing about them. But for me right now, just to bring it down to one word, it's just about relationships. That is the one thing in life that is the opposite of a jet ski. And the more I get, the deeper those relationships get, the more truthful, honest we are with each other, the more that that love pours out, the better and better and better it gets. I love it. Yeah, the the isolation thing is real, and I have this theory just on on uh, the ability to have a happy day. The more houses you collect, the planes you collect, the businesses you own, the odds that one thing isn't going massively wrong, that a jet ski is actually the problem of the day, means the ability to get to like call it peak happiness or just happy. You're just you're limiting the odds that you can ever get there because you wake up. Like there's always a problem at one of your five homes. There's your planes broken down, your pilot's sick and you stack all these little layers up in your life. We'll call them jet skis. One of your jet skis is always broken. Right. It's not bringing you happiness anyway. And it's just making the ability to ever get to a place where you could kind of, um, you know, I, I call it happiness or just being someone that doesn't have a lot of weight on their shoulders it almost becomes impossible and all rich people do it. I mean, it's almost an American, maybe it's not, it happens all over the world, but you see it all the time. Yeah. And the, the, the other thing that I've learned, which has really surprised me is, you know, people have said, Hey, don't, don't, don't put your stock in things. And I love things, but I've come to learn what are the things that I really love? I like two kinds of things. The first are, are things that I make. So things like this studio that I can really pour my heart and soul into and express myself deeply. This studio brings me an incredible sense of satisfaction and joy because it feels like an expression of me. And then the other thing is I like craftsmanship. I love going to a place where I can pick up and purchase something that I think is really beautiful, beautifully done. And that's correlated with brands, but it's not brands. But if I can wear something, I can own something that is a beautiful piece of craftsmanship, it brings me real satisfaction. And I think that the risk here is that you hear these things, you say, oh, like things, like I thought, oh, so don't like buy things, like don't put any stock in things. And it's like 99% of stuff, junk, not going to bring you satisfaction. But I think for me, I like asking what are the few sorts of things that really will? And I almost feel like that's underrated in the culture right now. One thing I like are things that you make because this studio is badass. Thanks, man. <laughs> Every room. All right. Two more. The internet traps us into a never ending now. Let's go. Yeah. Yeah. This is a big one. Um, this is This is one of the topics that I'm really fired up about. I think that one of the biggest 
I think the biggest mistake that we made with the internet was creating such a recency bias. Google, recent search results, you open up Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Reddit, whatever it is, it's all about what's been shared recently. And I think it's ridiculous. Basically, what we've done is we've created an incentive structure for people to to chatter and blab constantly and just create things over and over and over again to get people on this treadmill of new content creation. And I think it's terrible. I think that the way that information should be organized, the way it should be filtered is much closer to a library. It should be sorted by basically ranking relevance, which is topic times quality. So you're interested in something, whatever it is, and your the internet, your phone should basically say, what time of day is it? You should maybe put in some query of like, what am I interested in right now? And then the internet sort of morphs to now you're in that section of the library Mm -hmm. and it's not sorted by recency at all. It is wild to me that we have the greatest minds in our in our pocket from Plato to Nietzsche to Tolstoy. We can access them for free. And yet, what do we do when we open up our phones? We look at what are our friends posting? What was published recently? What was just shared in the news? This thing, that thing, this thing, that thing. And we're just trying to stay on this treadmill of being informed. And I think it is making us stupider. I think it's making us less happy. (laughs) It's taking us away from wisdom. And I think it's terrible. (laughs) If you don't know what he thinks, you do know. (laughs) All right. <laughs> that one always gets me on my high horse. It's just, it's such a little thing that would radically change I, our when psychological you put it that, I have not really thought about it that way, but you're right. I mean, the quality of life, when you get to the end, the quality of your life is basically the collective sum of what you've paid attention to. And so the gravity of the internet determines what we pay attention to and we're paying attention to this constant recency bias and it's garbage it's garbage it's not just the garbage but there's so much good stuff that's right there and we don't promote it it's like if you got on twitter yesterday and it was a tragedy it was it should not it's it's terrible that it happened but you would have spent most of your day thinking about a bridge in baltimore right so that day, so you only get so many days on earth. That day went to a bridge in Baltimore that you knew nothing about the day before. Right. You're not going to think about it the day after. But for that select few hours, that's going to be what you're going to think about. Yeah. And you really have no choice unless you just don't get on the internet, which might be yeah. a, a better answer. And here's the thing. What we've done is we've said, let's make people informed. And being informed is fine. But the opportunity cost of being informed is a loss of wisdom. Yep. And I would so much rather have a wiser people more than a well-informed people. Well, then uh, I said two more, but I'm going to add this and then off. You were talking about some of the best minds that are in our pocket for free. How is AI going to impact all this? Mm. And you did a podcast where you talked about how you, you use it to write, but in, in, in going off the never ending now, does AI make things better? Does it make things worse? Like, do you have an answer? I'm not, how, you've clearly thought about how it'll impact writing and things yeah. of that nature. Yeah. So I'll give you, there's a lot of doomerism with AI. So I'll give you a real white pill, like sort of a good thing is yeah. um, one of the nice things about AI is you can write in custom instructions. And so I specifically have, do not give me any sources after 1970. And that's how I would want to do it. I th- we were way smarter before 1970. Well, we were definitely definitely at higher information quality before the 2010s. A lot of things broke in the 2010s. Like if you look at a lot of charts and graphs of just the mass media and the things that were shared, something very weird happened between like 2012 and 2014. And then the, the 2016 presidential election just broke people's brains. So those four years really hurt the mainstream media environment. And it's not that we were way smarter than. I learned this from Amor Tolls in our How I Write episode, which is one of my favorite episodes. He said that history is not very good at knowing what things that have been created recently are of quality. There's a lot of noise there. History is exceptionally good at filtering 
old things and discarding the junk and keeping the good stuff. So the way that I think about it is that mother wisdom gets filtered through father time. Mm. And then what ends up at the bottom of that filter is your sort of gold and you just get rid of the the fool's gold. And the reason I do 50 years is not that we used to be smarter. It's that now I've had father time working for me. And so what's left at the bottom is the fruit. All right. Last one. Find your shiny dime. <laughs> what yes. is that? This is this is a writer thing here. <laughs> this okay. is a writer thing. So I have a shiny dime in the studio, one dime. And basically the thing that trips people up when they write is they don't know what their core idea is what their main thing that they're trying to say and not this dime but a dime is shiny it's really small and you look at it and it go ooh. and once you find that shiny dime you know it's half the size of a nickel but twice as valuable and once you find that shiny dime and you know what that central idea in your piece is going to be you end up writing way better and so often when people struggle to write they just don't know what that central message is so how do you find it what I like to do is what I call the 60 20 10 exercise. So take what you're trying to say and just speak it out loud for 60 seconds. Then you've said it and then do it again. Now you have 20 seconds and then do it again. Now you have 10 seconds. And something about the brain and the way that we speak is really good at compressing ideas in, the way, in a way that the fingertips aren't. We struggle to compress ideas in writing way easier in speaking. And I just always tell Rite of Passage students, you got to find your shiny dime. You got to find your shiny dime. And once you find that central idea and you can communicate it, then you know what you're writing about. You have a sense of direction and you can just let it rip. And that shiny dime could be for a, an article you're writing, maybe a business that you're starting, maybe a 50-year goal, but it's all kind of revolves around a shiny dime. Exactly. Exactly. And once you start thinking through what is my shiny dime? What is the core thing? Like for example, atomic habits, the shiny dime is atomic means three things. An atom is small. It is the building block of a system and an atom is super powerful. So atomic habits, two words, three meanings, habits, you have it all there. And he's so clear that we're going to, you're going to do the small things that lead to transformative results and you're going to build systems. And it's just in those two words. And when you have that sense of clarity in whatever it is that you're doing and you can communicate it, now you're staying focused. When you're writing, you automatically just have a really sharp razor where you can know what needs to be in, but more importantly, what doesn't need to be in. And the biggest mistake that writers make is that they write about too much. And the reason that they write about too much is they don't know the specific thing that they're trying to say, which you should be able to distill in one sentence. David. Thank you. That was fun, man. Thanks for driving me down. Appreciate it.